again today. Guess who we've got? Dr. Elaine, better late than never. Uh, Dr. Elaine Ingham, let me give you an intro. She is an American biologist, my favorite biologist, soil biology researcher, uh, known for the soil food web, finding that out, important stuff. In 1981, she earned a PhD from Colorado State University in microbiology, uh, along with her husband, Russ, who is a doctorate of zoology, emphasizing on nematology, which are these beautiful little, small little worm-like creatures in the soil. Um, also, a postdoctoral fellowship at the Natural Resource Ecology Lab at Colorado State University. So you've been everywhere, you've done everything. You've went to Oregon, and that's where you are today. Is that right? Yep, I um, have two companies here, Soil Food Web um, Inc. and Soil Food Web School. And so that's really what holds me in Corvallis. It's a wonderful place to live. Um, we've just had a really dry summer this year, so mm. not at its peak beauty. Um, yeah. yeah, so yeah, been here traveling all over the world, basically, um, bringing this information to lots of other people. So last time we talked, you were in Brazil, and you had just come back, and you were really excited. And then since then, you told me you've been now to Sri Lanka, Chicago, both exotic locations, very exotic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, what? So tell oh, Costa Rica. Oh, Costa Rica. That one in there. Oh, good coffee there. Yep. Good coffee. Mm-hmm. Oh, yep. God. Um, so, and tea. And tea. Do, can you just explain for everybody that's uh, watching uh, what... In a nutshell, what's the soil food web and how, you know, how's it get started? What are you trying to accomplish there? Um, we have seen that the difference between soil and dirt needs to be uh, explained to everybody. Uh, when you're dealing with dirt, all you are dealing with is the mineral part of that, that, that material. It's, um, mostly in crystalline form. It's uh, no life in it, no bacteria, no fungi, no protozoa, nematodes, microarthropods. Dirt is just the mineral component of what we hope we will be able to turn into soil. So what's the difference? Soil has to have living organisms in it. And we want the living organisms that will best grow the plants that you want to grow in that material. So we've got to put back in the bacteria and the fungi and protozoa, nematodes, microarthropods, earthworms, all of those things. If we want to be able to grow plants without pesticides, without inorganic fertilizers, with all, all the toxic materials we rain down, and when you start looking at current practices every week, at the very least, the farmers in the uh, in the fields, applying something because your plant uh, is incapable of gaining access to any of the nutrients that are present in crystalline form that are in that um, not soluble stage in the in the soil in the in the material that you have. So um, you've got to be bringing in the bacteria and fungi so that uh, the plant, as it starts to grow, puts out exudates, which are basically just sugars and proteins and carbohydrates in various mixtures. Different mixtures grow different microorganisms. So basically it's the plant's way of telling the bacteria and the fungi what the plant wants from those two organisms. And so the plant ba basically has picked up the phone like you were ordering pizza or something, and um, say say to the, and, and then the say is in the form of the exudates, to the bacteria and the fungi, go out, find some potassium, find some nitrogen, find some whatever the plant needs. There it is in black and white. And the bacteria and fungi say, oh, I can make, I can go get that. I can go get no problem. So the bacterium, or the fungi put, puts out the enzymes to break down the crystalline structure of the mineral component of that dirt and pull the, those nutrients into the bacterial or fungal biomass 
So those both are happy, growing. They got enough of that extra food that the, um, they're chugging right along and they go back to the root system and they're having a fun time. And the plant says, you know, um, I, wa I, I want my potassium now. And so here comes this uh, protozoan or this um, nematode or you know, any, whatever eats a bacterium or a fungus comes along, eats the bacteria and the fungi. And because the concentration of nutrients, every single nutrient that a plant or our microorganisms could use, are going to the extra that is inside the bacteria and fungi because there's way more of those nutrients in bacteria and fungi as compared to the plant. And so all the extra gets released out into the soil solution. It's soluble with water and that's what the plant has to have. It's gotta be soluble. It can't deal with the not soluble forms of massive amounts of those nutrients in the mineral portion of your soil and you, you know, so here comes the the nutrients into the plant. The plant says, thank you very much. That was wonderful, but I'm now lacking in manganese and calcium and whatever the plant needs. The message goes out to the bacteria and fungi. They gather it in. The bacteria and the fungi get eaten. Of course, they've reproduced several million times before they reach the point that some of them get eaten. But that's the classic understanding of how nutrients um, cycle in soil. But it's, it hasn't been too long ago that we realized that mycorrhizal fungi go out into the soil, pull nutrients into the hyphae, transport those nutrients back to the plant and exchange those two things, sugar, protein, carbs from the plant into the fungus so the fungus can keep growing. And then the nutrients that your plant requires in order to continue growing. So there's a second way of getting really important nutrients into your plant. Well, and it was only a couple years ago that Dr. Um, James White at Rutgers University put, uh, saw these bacteria and fungi around the root tip of plants and wondered what the heck they were doing there and showed that the plant was attracting those microorganisms at a certain point where the concentration right outside that root tip was adequate. The plant would um, kind of, um, would take all of the cellulose and the hard, impossible to cross um, materials, we just, you know, convert it, pull all of those bacteria and fungi into the root tip, and then slam the door shut. And so all of these, these bacteria and fungi are now inside. They're still partying around. They don't know they're stuck in, you know, bad. So the plant uh, throws some hydroxides out and get some of the nutrients out of the bacteria and the fungi. At that point, to put it into human terms, they sort of figured out that uh, the party was consuming them and they needed to escape. So they just go up along the um, outside of that, uh, the outside the inside layer of your um, uh, root to where the root hairs start are, are being produced. And there's apparently a way for these organisms to um, escape. No one's shown where that escape nodule is or anything, but it's obvious that they were inside the root and now they are not inside the root. And so all these bacteria and fungi are now going down the root, um, pulling in soluble nutrients that the plant's not picking up and having a grand old time and they go back to the tip of the root. And they just continue this over and over and over and over again, apparently. Whoa. So what a what a great way to get the nutrients that you want. The plant has so many choices. Well, the bacteria and the fungi have so many choices too. Which which where do you want to go today? I want to go to the roller coaster. I want to go to the pizza delivery guy. <laughs> yeah, mycelium is like the waiter that serves the plant. He's like, "What would you like today?" Oh, okay, I'll be back. I'll you know just wait here and I'll bring it to you. Yeah, the kitchen has lots of it, and I'll just gotta I'll you know yeah. pour a soup for you. Be back. Be back. Be back in ten minutes. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so that's that's those are very important functions. But then, of course, there's a huge number of other, and we've we've got a list of eleven different functions that the soil food web um, brings to your plant. Like bacteria and fungi are the only things that can build structure in soil because the bacterium has the glue to glue together this little this silt with this this clay with this sand molly oh let's pull a little bit of food in here so some organic matter so we can hang out in our condominium space and enjoy the good life because everything just comes to us basically and so you know, one group of bacteria is in the first aggregate and it's, you know, a couple micrometers across, uh, maybe only one micrometer meter wide, and then they'll glue on another aggregate and they'll glue on another aggregate. And then the fungus comes along and takes its hyphae and binds those things all together. So it compresses them into an apartment house. And now you've got all this space for oxygen to come from above ground and move down into the soil. Um, water infiltrates immediately. It doesn't you know, back up and get anaerobic and smells terrible and the beneficial organisms are gonna die if it's anaerobic. The disease causing organisms are going to now be taken over and you can smell it. When, whenever you smell that, you know, the manure smell or, you know, it just smells like a, you know, a skunk just passed through here. Um, so that's another really important part of what bacteria and fungi do. And then, of course, when the uh, protozoa and the nematodes and microarthropods, when they start moving into that area, they widen the important channels. So you have little, you know, like small little roads, dirt country type roads. And then you have a little bit wider space that's, you know, the two lane um, in, in, the, in the cities. And then, the, then you get the freeway and one, you see one group of things going this way and the other groups going this way. And then pretty soon you've got two groups going that way and two groups going that. And then you've got two going this way and one going this way. Just all these different kinds of passageways all because you've got the bacteria and fungi full holding on to uh, forming these um, uh, aggregates to begin with so uh, it just is amazing mother nature has been working on these processes for the last well 3.5 billion years um, and i think she's had time to get them down pretty right she's discarded the things that didn't work she she put, put, puts over and over and over again the um, what exactly what your plant needs in order to get the nutrients that he wants. And so as we go through succession, of course, all of this changes slightly. It's different species of bacteria and fungi, protozoa and nematodes, doing different amounts. But the ultimate effect is to feed your plant all the nutrients that it needs. So your plant will always be healthy. Your plant now has the ability to turn on its um, mechanism for killing disease-causing organisms. So in the leaf, when a disease-causing organism falls to the leaf uh, of the plant, in fact, the, the um, spore of the disease-causing fungus never ever touches the plant in any way. And so that spore, that disease-causing spore, landing here expecting that that was going to be the surface of the plant that it was out to eat, never wakes up. That, that um, spore will never cause a problem because there's so many bacteria and fungi growing on the exudates that come out of that plant that there, even if that spore germinated, it wouldn't be able to find its way through this conglomeration a bacteria, fungi, protozoa, and nematodes. And so no disease happens. So a very important part of all of this is keeping your plants healthy. You don't have healthy plants, you keep getting this fungal disease or that fungal disease or maybe even a bacterial disease. It's just, you know, the nematodes are coming in and killing everything. You've got to look at what's in your soil. Do you have the organisms that will 
pre uh, prevent the disease causing organisms from being able to germinate and grow. If it does germinate and grow, it gets eaten uh, or it gets um, you know, punt kicked back out into the um, dirt surrounding. <laughs> into the big um, nature library, so, yeah. See. That's right. Who's going to eat this one? Yeah. So does <laughs> the does, does the fungal um, like a good uh, mycelial network? Does that stop the? Does good fungus stop the bad fungus from coming too? Yeah, typically because the good fungi are are opening up those aggregates. They're um, making certain that the super highways of oxygen. Nutrients, water coming through, they're um, all making certain that the habitat, the conditions in that soil are conditions that grow the good guys and not the bad guys. And again, it's uh, making the right kinds of foods um, coming from the aerobic organisms, the not good um, foods made by the anaerobic um, disease causing organisms. You can see where, you know, you, you want to, we want to make sure that we keep all the aerobic guys functioning and doing their jobs. And anytime you can see that your plant's not doing so well, it's looking a little sickly, um, take a quick look at what the biology is in the soil around that root system and find out what's wrong. And typically mm -hmm. you can get a pretty good message on what you need to do to bring the system to bring that plant back to a condition of health. Mm, cool, that is so cool. So I, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go through all eleven. No, you're really different. Uh, <laughs> but I can just start you up, and then you're off and running. You're like, I know all this stuff. Just hold on to your hat. Um, so, but I want to get to some of the questions that I, I was given all week because everybody was so excited that I was going to be able to talk to you. So I got one guy asked, uh, would organic worm castings be ideal or a suitable option for someone living in the city for uh, to apply a beneficial set of microorganisms uh, if you can't compost? Yeah, um, you want to make certain that you've got the mix of, of foods in that worm bin that will promote the aerobic organisms some you know some people try to pile on too much real heavy um, material on the top where you feed the worms is always going to be or typically what people do is the food wastes or whatever you're using to feed the worms goes on top which draws the worms up and as you're drying the worms up to the surface there's all that air freeway um, to get oxygen and water and everything else into the uh, worm bin. So now the worm bins come up and they start eating. They're going to convert some of that into uh, worm biomass. Uh, the other is going to be converted into uh, um, bacterial and fungal foods. And so that's why it's really critical to keep this whole operation aerobic because you don't want any ugly little surprises that as you scrape the um, worm compost off the bottom of the worm bin and let it fall into your container, um, you want to make certain that there's no bad smells. You might even want to check that through your microscope have it you know, right there so you can quick do the dilution and a drop of water goes on, a cover slip, and you look and you go, whoa, look at all those really good things running around in there. We don't have to worry. Or you look in there and you go, ugh. Uh, Light a match. If, you're, if your compost pile <laughs> explodes, you've done it wrong. <laughs> That's right. But luckily we can smell much faster than we, uh, uh, you know, lighting that match and then dealing with the consequences. Because I've dealt with people who have blown up worm bins. Oh, shit. Um, <laughs> and it, <laughs> yeah, that was, there oh, was. No. <laughs> Those poor worms. Yep. Fried worms for, and bacteria, mm. and fungi, protozoan, <laughs> nematodes, everything. It was. That's a horror it was show. Just, it was yeah. heart rending. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's life. Yep. Um. I got another. Yep. I got Learn another. To use your nose. Yeah, right. 
Uh, I got another question here. Uh, Dr. Elaine, what does a certain ratio of fungal feeding versus bacterial feeding versus plant parasitic nematodes say about soil health or certain agricultural practices? Does that make sense? If they've got that kind of diversity, that they've got all three types of beneficial nematodes, that's an indicator that things are, are going pretty pretty well. But now you want to go a little bit further with this um, way of measuring whether it's healthy or not. When you're going through su succession, um, right, you know, like you have a catastrophic, catastrophic um, eh, come on, <laughs> my brain, yeah, catastrophic disturbance. Time for some um, coffee here. I, I, Cheers. Yeah, yeah. Either that or <laughs> cheers. Yeah, find the find the cup. There we go. <laughs> so, um, cheers. At, at a <laughs> try this go. again. <laughs> Clink. Click. All right. Yep. Hmm. Okay. Ah, that's good stuff. Um. So when as you're as that catastrophic disturbance is happening, generally all of the microorganisms in the soil are going to be destroyed, either by heat or um, any, any one of a number of things, toxic chemicals that go into the soil that are made because it's burning at a, you know, 600 degrees um, Celsius or Fahrenheit, I don't think it matters, everything's dead. And so there's no way to hold on to the soluble nutrients. There's no way to uh, maintain the aggregates. And so all of that is lost from the system. Now, as Mother Nature starts to repair things, she has to have things like mosses, uh, photosynthetic um, organisms that will be able to take that sunlight energy and start converting it into exudates in the soil. Um, bacteria will be selected for uh, strictly. Uh, fungi don't have a chance early on in succession because you've got to get organisms back into this system that will um, that will start to build the structure. So getting micro aggregates, but without any fungi, you're not going to get the macro aggregates. Um, so there's a little bit of nutrient cycling, but it's very easy for water logging and um, you know bad things to happen and go backwards for a while. Mm -hmm. Instead of making soil, you're destroying soil and then it starts to rebuild and then you have springtime and it gets flooded again. And yeah, so you want to hurry through that stage of succession as fast as you can because you're not growing anything worthwhile. Usually the outcome of that part of succession is you're going to grow a lot of things that we as human beings call weeds. Mm. They grow really rapidly. They produce lots of spores. They don't contribute much to the soil. So only maybe 20 to 30% of the biomass of a weed is uh, in roots. Otherwise, all of the rest of that um, is the weight of that or biomass of that plant is in seed production. Mm. So it's going to take a while if you just rely on kind of Mother Nature getting you through these bad, you know, difficult times. You've got to make some compost and get the balance of the bacteria and fungi, protozoa, and nematodes to what your plant requires. And so we're always looking at the soil and saying, okay, so what we've got in here is barely acceptable. We've, we've got 135 micrograms of bacterial biomass. We've got um, 100 micrograms of fungi per gram of soil. We, you know, the desired range of things. We want a thousand of the beneficial protozoa and we want at least 10, 100 would be a lot nicer, of the um, bacterial feeding nematodes, fungal feeding nematodes, and predatory nematodes. We do not want root feeders. Anytime you find a root feeder, you, you better work pretty hard, pretty fast, because if you don't get rid of that, um, 
root feeding nematodes, you aren't going to have roots. And it's kind of hard for your plant to grow. Kind of important, so, everybody, to get their roots. And I, yeah. just, I just found out that the, some nematodes uh, eat uh, each other. Like there's cannibalistic nematodes. Is that true? Yep. 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 Dirty. So they're Dirty. they're <laughs> their main food. Their favorite stuff is well, you know. So you're dealing with lions and tigers and bears. Oh my. Um, it, it's a good nutrient cycling system, and it does. Is it's a very good way to control those root feeding nematodes is to get the um, omnivores, uh, omnivore nematodes back into the system as well. So, yeah, it, and we cool. teach you how to identify all of these things. And the, uh, the first, the foundation courses, we teach people how to use the microscope and how to uh, identify the organisms so you know whether you've got the good guys or the bad guys. Um, be paying attention to, you know, do I have good aggregation or is everything just kind of smushed? into each other and there are no passageways no hallways you're going to have the disease there that you work hard and fast at trying to get the biology back into the soil mm. and the way you get the biology back into the soil is to make your own compost yeah. you don't want to go outside your biome and because the organisms outside your biome don't really work very well in your biome uh, they're supposed to be in that biome, not this right. biome. Stop and, trying to and, mess. Uh, with, play. Stop trying to play God, for Christ's sakes. Um, yeah, so, the only person who can do that is Mother Nature. Yeah, <laughs> come on. Uh, and but, if if you make Mother Nature angry, you <laughs> will be sorry. <laughs> I knew I liked you. Um, that, but that leads me to this question that somebody had, too. It's like, do you think it's possible to simply inoculate poor soils with microorganisms in order to increase soil health? Or does it, or should you do it the natural way? Or, you know, what do you think? Well, compost is a very natural way of doing things because, you know, leaves are supposed to fall from the trees, fall from the shrubs. Uh, you're supposed to have, you know, grass. Uh, and so lots of mixtures, the more diversity in food, the more likely you are going to have some organism functioning and helping your plants and keeping them safe, preventing diseases, all of that sort of thing. So, um, if your only choice is to go out and, and, and buy an inoculum, you really want to be able to take a look at that inoculum under the, using a microscope. Because mm. what we've been seeing in most cases is that when we take some of that material that says, you know, it has 10 to the eighth um, of these, this species of bacteria and, you know, and then 10 to the five um, of this bacterium and 10 to the 12th of this bacterium, we put it under the microscope and there are no bacteria Ooh. in that material. So, you know, people are, well, you know, was, was it something that I did wrong and I should go buy, a, go buy two or three bottles and put it on at the same time. Yeah. Uh, I know there are very, there are good companies that are making good X, you know, good inocula. But then you want to look at what those things are really doing in the soil. Um, when you put that inoculum of bacteria, uh, like the le uh, um, lactobacillus, is really good at forming aggregates. Lots of slimy, gluey stuff to get aggregates up and going. But when is it too much? Right. So, you know, it's when we're going through making compost. Put your inoculum in there. Um, go out and collect inoculum from every place you can think of in your biome that's different. You know, you've never gotten this one from the uh, underneath somebody's blackberry bush or something. Right. Um, and put all of those small little bits. You don't have to pay anybody for it either. Most people, if they see you lean over and pick up some of the soil and put it in a baggie, they'll just kind of go, 
wonder what they need that for. Nerds. <laughs> or, <laughs> yeah. yeah, or they'll know exactly what you're doing and saying, well, I got a handful of really good compost back here. Do you want to just, just take that and throw it in yours? Tell me how it turned out when you, you know, because so, yeah. it is becoming much more recognized that what we're doing is having a lot of difference and helping out people who can't afford to buy toxic chemicals and right. um, seeds and all of that sort of thing. I've been, I've so been, did I answer your question? I think so. We're doing pretty good. I'm evangelical about what yeah. you do because I think it's, yeah, it's an incredibly common sense uh, thing where I think, oh, yeah, come on. Um, but um, you, know, I, I, as you're talking to, I have all these questions, but then, you know, I'll just, we got to break this into sections. You have to come back and do this again in a few months, you know? <laughs> so, um, so somebody else had a question. They said, uh, what about water? What what components that are found inside water, aside from, of course, chlorine, has uh, effects on microbial communities? Um, any of the toxic chemicals that they add to kill, to kill, to kill whatever in, in the soil, to kill these bacteria, to kill these fungi, mm. um, you're probably going to kill more of the beneficial organisms when you use ha that kind of approach, then you are going to kill the disease causers, the problem organisms. So it, you're not gaining anything. You're going, you're pushing your own land back into catastrophic disturbance layer, and now you've got to bring back all, you know, all of the pain and torture of um, having to. You know, get us back into a place where we've got both bacteria and fungi present in the soil. You really can't grow things if you don't have both bacteria and fungi and at least some of their predators in the system. Mm. So we've, we've got to have that whole mix. Um, don't push yourself backwards, push yourself forward. And so please don't use pesticides or inorganic fertilizers ever at all, ever again. You don't need it. Please. And if you can do some, if you can do some calculations of how much nutrient, and, and there's one very important factor that, that the, the chemical guys always want to bring up. Chemical guys always say, well, the roots of this, uh, you know, here's your soil surface. Here's my hands. Um, here's the soil surface. And the roots grow down, but then go sideways. So mm. that's um, natural. That's what the roots normally do. No, they don't. Go out into the uh, good, healthy ecosystem, and the root systems of those plants are going that way. Mm. For example, I think it's at the University of Iowa. No, Iowa State University. Where outside the library, they took a, a plant and all of its root system and uh, it's in a little box, and so you can see how deep this little shrub has roots going down 40 feet. Holy smokes. It needs to get to all of the water in the, in the late, late summer. You have to have a way of getting to the water that is being held down below the evaporation layer. So you've got to have, your roots have to be going down. Five, six, 10, 20, 50. How deep are the root systems on Douglas fir? 250 oh, feet. Holy smokes. So they, they manage to grow even when it's you know, as dry in the summertime as, as we're seeing right now. Um, it, it, those root systems are going down deep. They'll survive it. Not a problem. Hmm. Well, how about the food, the uh, vegetables in your, in your garden or your um, orchard trees, we need to let them go down deep, deep, deep because that's how Mother Nature made them. It's when you have a compaction layer right here below, at you know, just right a few inches below. When the roots grow down, this is anaerobic. In a compacted layer, you don't have enough oxygen because any growth in here used up all of the oxygen long ago. So the root systems on your plant goes, oh, I can't go down there. I, it'll kill my roots. And so what it does is go sideways. And now any plant that's anywhere close to it is gonna be in warfare for the nutrients, for the water, for 
absolutely everything. So we've we got we have to you know for the last time ever you're going to dig up your soil and mix it as well as you can. Put lots of good compost in there so that those organisms start rebuilding structure instantaneously. The organisms in that in a good compost can um, grow as rapidly as um, some of the work that we were doing was showing um, 14, 14 days as uh, going from a place where you could only put on um, maybe half an inch of water and you could see that the surface was puddling. Totally anaerobic because yeah. any organisms growing in that water, using it up, uh, you you can't get the fusion of of um, air or water. Well, you've got to get the all of that working again before you can get rid of the anaerobic conditions. Holy smokes! So, yeah, yeah. Hey, that's the way. The good sign that your soil is incredibly damaged in a lot of ways. Um, so, but uh, so I get uh, some questions about. And also, oh, go ahead. And and also, when you're digging up. And you find that your root systems are only going down this far, you now know how to fix that immediately. Get that biology out there and rebuild structure. Sometimes you, you know, if you've got a little bit of time, you just make a really good extract of your really good compost. Compost has got all the right organisms, yay, in the right numbers for yeah. your plant. Um, and then you extract those organisms into water, and we call that a compost extract. So we've just used water to pull those organisms off the surfaces. Yeah, you got to pay attention to how fast the bubbling rate is. You, you know, want, don't want to over aerate. You don't want to under aerate. You, you know, so it takes a little, but you know, but all I mean, of us can manage to do that. What, once it's done, though, the, uh, you're supposed to not till it again. Ho hopefully, you wouldn't have to till it because everything would be locked in, right? Yep. Because now you're going to put on that extract and maybe a layer of your good compost on top and let that go to town. You shouldn't have to muck about with it ever again. Hmm. One of the things I like to do is put an understory, a nice set of seeds, you know, get uh, 20 different species of plants that don't grow very, very tall um, that you like that maybe even, you know, like a clover uh, like Dutch white clover usually only grows that tall. Uh, Dachandra not doesn't grow that tall. And now you cover every surface. Uh, and that means those roots going down are rebuilding structure faster than the roots of your plant, of your desired plant, maybe moving down through that soil. So everything's nice and cushy for your plant once those root systems get going and get moving down through the soil. Still need to start but, um, thinking about lightweight, extremely lightweight tractors now, because obviously that's the big caveat <laughs> with industrialized stuff is that we need to you the, know, not squish the soil. Well, but just think um, the, what we're trying, what we're trying to work on right now is to get enough of the um, drones and uh, you f they can carry six gallons of water. And so we put the compost extract in there and they can go all the way down your field, turn around and come back before they have to be refilled. Well, shit, maybe I do like so robots. Just, it, I, I know, it's like, well, I, I guess I'm enough of a, a, a game player on computers that this just fits my mentality perfectly. I get to stand at the top of the hill and watch my minions go forth and turn around and come back up. And then they're all faithfully waiting there to be refilled. Yeah. So, yep. I think it's entirely doable to not have to drive your truck on your um, soil in your fields ever. I mean, which is fun. Let's get, let's be honest. That is fun, but this sounds like more fun just to sit there and play that game, deploying the drones to, <laughs> you know. Um, so uh, some, somebody else has a question here. I think it's a pretty good question. In nature, it said that there is 2,500 uh, to one good bug species versus bad bug species, and that one to 2% of all pests are bad 
bat species. Would you estimate this to be true in the microbial world as well? No, it's not true. Ah. Um, because there's a majority of the species that I know of anyway, um, they are beneficial. They're going to be helping out. Now, you can't call something um, a pathogen in areas where the conditions are that this bacterium or this fungus, protozoan, whatever, um, they are they are capable, perhaps, under certain conditions to be pathogenic. But in the majority of conditions, they're going to be doing good things for your plant. So again, this goes back to the biome concept. When you, you walk over there into biome number 32 and you bring, bring some of that home and put it in to your compost pile, you might be heading yourself down the road of, of a disease-causing organism because none of these, these organisms in biome number one have ever seen that bacterium. Right. And now because it's got, you know, got all this ability and womp, here you go, it's going to be growing, it's going to be taken off. And all the normal things in your in your compost were kind of going like, ooh, who invited him? Right. Um, how do we get rid of him? What should we do? <laughs> that sounds like me and, at a party. They always say that about me. They go, who's this guy? <laughs> <laughs> who let him in um so yeah try to be careful on that biome thing um so you don't just go everywhere on the planet and bring it back and put it into your compost right but so so let me ask you this so how long when you separate two things that maybe were born together you know but separated at birth and then how long before they de potentially detrimental to each other like two biospheres collide how far apart do they have to be for how long and what distance yeah, I don't think we have real good answers on that because oh, I think the the most reasonable response is it depends. Yeah. Yeah. The we just haven't looked into that part. It's hard enough to find people who know how to really do the DNA analysis correctly. Um, okay. Interesting. Yeah, we... We, yeah, we some of the methods that that people have for assessing biology in soil are problematic. Um, they don't really have anything that they the control the the um, you know like when you're um, running a race and you have the rabbit that's going along. That's kind of the pacer for everybody. Hmm. Um, we don't have pacers, right? So we don't know. Yeah, there's so much about soil that we don't know. Right. Um, they, a lot of times you have to just cross your fingers and make a choice and see what happens. So when we are putting new stuff into our compost, we never do like a whole acre of it. We'll do a 10 by 10 area. So we find out what's going on. Is it all positive? Is it all negative? It's going to work fine on my potato fields in Idaho. But if you took it to citrus groves in Florida, you'd be in deep doo-doo. Wow. You know, we've only, it's, yeah. It's so mo keep more staying cost within efficient. your biome. Yeah, more cost efficient to not do the DNA analysis and go just go out there, spread it around, and then see what, you know. Yeah. Yep. Use your microscope to see what you um, you can see pretty easily. Uh, you know, the microscopes are uh, along the lines of you know five hundred to six hundred dollars. Uh, you can buy some really fancy cameras. I don't do that. Um, I'm cheap. Uh <laughs> <laughs> I knew I liked you. So. <laughs> yeah. I'd be, I do. I would be the same. I'm a cheap date. I I, I like walks in the park and you know. Anything yep. free. Let's see how fast we can get up to the top of the hill. Yeah. And yep. That's uh, fun. Uh, yeah. So, and I, I've got so many questions here. We're not going to get to get them all, people. But uh, let's see. I'll give it. I'll throw another one out there. Um, cover cropping in pots in smaller container. Uh, yay or nay? Sure, um, but you do have to leave some space. Um, so I'd, I'd always pick the larger pot to um, put the cover plants in as well as have your crop. 
Um, and certainly if it is a big container, big pot, and you've got a lot of soil sur surface, it's much, much safer to have other plants growing in there rather than your main um, crop uh, because you're going to be preventing disease um, getting dropped into the, you know, people like to, <laughs> you know, smoke a cigarette and put the ashes and squ squish out the things for the uh, tobacco just covered with God only knows what kind of horror. Oh, yeah. Um, surprise, you've yeah. got a disease. Smoking was so, the stupidest yeah. thing I ever did. It's got, got every chemical known to man. Yeah. All I can do is hope that it has dissipated over the years because my mother and father both smoked like just never didn't have a cigarette lit. Yeah. And my mom would go through the house and light a cigarette in each room <laughs> so that when she m walked from the bathroom to the dining room to the kitchen, she already had. And that's the, you know, we lived in that until we were, how old? We all yeah. escaped. <laughs> You know, I'm you know, I'm younger than you, but I still got the same thing. It was like we can't smoking in the car, but we're not going to roll down the windows because it's too cold. I'm like, oh god! I'm like, very nice, you know. Thanks yeah. for the yeah. yeah. Thanks for yeah. the boost. Lungs. Yeah. Yep. I'm like, I'm 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 getting a little antsy. I think I need to get back in the car, go for a drive. I don't know. <laughs> no, I'm, jo I'm Jonesy. Anything but that. <laughs> Cigarette smell. Oh, oh, I know. Just... Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, cannabis will. So I try to avoid it. Cannabis will yep. dissipate, but tobacco sticks around forever. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Different, different situation with cannabis. So. Yeah. Um, All right. Well, that 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 I got one guy. I think he's a weed grower because he asked me some specific thing about uh, what would be the ideal fungal to bacterial ratio for hemp or licensed medical cannabis, and would this change based on vegetative or flowering? What do you know about grass? Well, I'm I have I have helped people grow. But it is not something I've undertaken by myself um, because we work with the soil. We're not so much on the above ground part of the plant. Um, you know, when you need to put out a compost tea to deal with a fungal disease that it's attacking your plant, you, you want to make certain you're always looking at the bottom side of the leaf. The top is, you know, a, a couple days behind the, the bottom part of the leaf. So if you want to know really, um, is, is this a, is this going to be a problem organism? You want to look at the bottom of the leaf. Pull a leaf off the plant, stick it under your microscope, and see what that is. If it's these nice little fungal strands, very narrow diameter, typically maybe uh, with septa or without, without cross walls, um, pretty much that's going to be a disease, and you want to get the your plant sprayed. Um, typically, uh, most of the, uh, I, mean, I haven't dealt with all the, the variety of um, hemp or, um, or um, just space the name, the plant. Um, so the best we can really say to you is it needs to be fungal dominated. Mm. Some of the species like to be very fungal dominated. So we have a two times more fungi than bacteria. Um, some of them are very close one-to-one. -one. Um, people even have called me and said um, they, they, ha they were having good growth with uh, something that had a ratio of 0. 0.9. So, you know, I think there's a lot of it depends that is going on here. How good was the compost? Um, what are the, what's the biology in the soil that you're dealing with? Is it really top notch? Everything's really cooking really well, or is it that you know you, things are kind of lackadaisical? The nutrient cycling is off, and it's not really behaving correctly. So you want to be looking at all of those things. Um, yeah. So. What else does he want to know? Yeah, I mean, uh, trial and error, folks. Just trial and error. 
Yeah, because your you know your greenhouse is different from everybody else's greenhouse. Temperature. So start establishing. Mm -hmm. it, yeah. Yes. It is it a cold autumn or is it going to be hot until December? Right. Um, right. Right. You. Is yeah, it humid? Yeah, put things. Yeah, keep looking at your soil so you see what's going on with the biology, and I would encourage you to probably certainly when you start out is to aim for the one-to-one -one ratio of fungi to bacteria. And then make sure you got the protozoa in there, at least 10,000 per mil. Um, and then you need uh, the uh, nem the good guy nematodes. Mm -hmm. And you want somewhere probably you know, 10 to 100 um, of those guys uh, per mil would, be, would uh, probably give you really good growth. Mm -hmm. And then from there, you could have, you know, uh, five pots that you're you've doubled the amount of fungi or five pots that you quadrupled the bacteria or something and just see what results what's fun is sometimes it changes the whole flavor of the leaf and uh so what you got here was like a uh, roses and over here they taste they when they smoked them it was um Completely different flavor. Whoa. Cool, man. Yeah. That's groovy. Yeah. I, I, yeah, but I'm you down. can see where you got to do got to do some testing yourself to see what you're going to get. Somebody, they say, oh, my God, huge answer. Holy shit. OMG. <laughs> I think you did a good job with that one. <laughs> uh, so, um, and I did want to just mention quickly, I, I, talking about biodiversity and stuff, I knew a guy, Elson Shields, he, he's a nematode specialist guy up there in Cornell, and he, he was telling me most of the nematode people that are out there selling the nematodes, they're making them with planned obsolescence where they're making them that they're weak, they're not diverse, they're not like a strong thing, and then they sell because they want them to uh, die over the next year. But this fella is doing rich diversities in nematodes, and they it's like you buy them once and you stick it stays forever is that does that sound about right yeah that's about right um you know commercial people they you know they want you to buy it they don't want them to survive once they they go in and into the soil so here's where you know unless you can assess what you know go buy one package and take a look at the nematodes put them into a compost and see Mm -hmm. um you know do they survive do they did they manage to take off or did they just whimper out um yeah I'd go to a different company it's yeah. just easier to, to to go out into your own biome and take samples from all over where are the plants growing really really well you know where is your corn at 12 feet tall and it's got six cods cobs on it um you mm -hmm. want to take a bit the soil from that or that plant because obviously it's doing very very well in your environment under your conditions so you don't always have to go buy this try to check it out well they're all looking just kind of stunned or something well they probably forgot and put chlorine in the water and then yeah so oh, lord almighty <laughs> We got a long way yep. to go, Dr. Elaine. We got a long way before we're going to figure all this out, I think. Humans yep. will do Well, you it. and I will never be <laughs> lacking in in a job. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just here to make it fun. You're the one doing all the hard work. I don't know. Um, so I'll look, I'll ask you one <laughs> last I'll ask you, ask you one more question, let you get back to your life, but I want you to come back and do this again sometime because you're just a hoot sure. and an inspiration, okay? <laughs> And then, we'll, and then after okay. we'll we'll talk a little bit after because I want to uh, also talk off the record. But the last question is, I think it's a pretty good one. Do you see viability with planting new seeds of the same species nearby a previous plant which is still growing the same species? According to Dr. Jones, I don't know who that is. Plants will feed specific microbes which brought with it inside a seed. Assuming this, would that make for the perfect environment? for the next seed to be planted. What, will those microbes be thriving with the plant life uh, of the same species? I think it's, yeah. Is that, uh, does that make any sense? It's a little confusing. Yeah. I, I, I think, um, I think, 
like if if the microbes where you grew cantaloupe this year will be still there and and good for cantaloupe next year i would just assume yes i don't know yes yeah yeah i'm pretty sure unless you know you had a really odd abnormal winter time um mm. so you know it's it's why i always like to have cover plants yeah. so that it doesn't matter that i harvested my crop plant um, and usually I just let the residues fall on top of the understory plants and they should be completely decomposed come the next spring after winter is over. Um, if you don't see most of that plant material decomposing, then you know that you lost your mi microorganism somewhere along the line mm. and that you'll probably want to go back to your compost and uh, do an, an extract. Uh, and spray the extract over everything um, so that you bring back that biology as rapidly as possible. You, you know, why don't we do... It, but it should survive. Why don't we do legumes as a, as a cover because of that nitrogen fixation? It just seems like the beans could save the world. It Quite often, um, the beans like to climb on things, and that'll so just I. pull your plant right over. Oh, okay. Right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I want to, you know, beans have that unfortunate. But then like trefoils, they're nice and short and they yeah. don't ever grow bigger. So get one of those small, uh, smaller height um, trefoil or, you know, if you're trying to grow corn, corn can tolerate something six in inches as cover. Um, so finding good cover, that's a good way to um, have a good inoculum and is where you have, uh, um, you know, in, in Oregon where I live, we will have nice warm toasty days and everybody thinks spring is on its way. And then we get two inches of snow um, and we're definitely not. <laughs> and so that could trick some of your organisms to wake up and start growing and they could be knocked out. But if you've got your compost left, so you don't need to save much compost, just enough to start your next compost pile and make an uh, um, make a extract for applying your organisms and revamp where you don't have to go back out and do all of the collection all over the biome or try to buy this and that and the other thing that you would put in. Uh, mm. um, yeah. yeah, I know most commercial people won't like that they're not gonna like you well you know, what the you hell do. with them you know <laughs> we don't have to sell everything but do we've we? got to make a living too <laughs> <laughs> grow food <laughs> come on dude grow food um look I, I i'll let you go look dr elaine ingham wonderful human being um I, I don't know what else to say uh, for uh, soilfoodweb.com is that right um where can we find you? What, if people are more interested, how can we drive some you know, action your way? Yeah, we um, really would like to have people take the foundation courses because that we go through every single benefit. How do you determine whether the good guys are in there or not? Um, you know, all of the kinds of signaling. We teach you how to use the, the microscope. We're not expecting you to become experts. We don't need to have the highest power magnification just in simple 40x um, um yeah 40x plus a 10x ipad piece gives you 400 total mag that's uh that's as high as we go mm. it's not oil immersion it's not a mess to to deal with because we ha only need to get a good idea of what the sets of organisms are. We don't have to know that this was 5,462 right. protozoa. I, as long as it's 5,430, uh, it's close enough. I'd even question you on the 30, 5,700, <laughs> close enough. Um, Who is the, so don't, you don't get, get the young that trap. Get the young students to do all the counting. They say, "Did you? Oh, I think you're wrong. Count them again. <laughs> Count them again." <laughs> we we do have a fair um, 
a, a time it takes to get students understanding why we have to take so many samples. Because um, we want to know that, you know, like if the first one was 5,700 and 5,700 protozoa, um, and the next one was two protozoa, you have not properly re replicated what you're doing, and you now need to figure out, and we'll help them go through all of that, so that particular problem yeah. doesn't happen. But it is, yes, yeah, we we've got to introduce them to the to the world of statistics, right. or as That's, I like to say, statistics. Statistics <laughs> numbers are very <laughs> dark and. Yeah, yeah. Well, it sounds a lot yeah. like me when I had to count the money at the till when I had a, a job at the at the drive-in when I was sixteen. I was like, not coming up. Ah, my counting skills aren't so good. I'm an artist, <laughs> as you can tell. Um, all right, that's right. Well, stick around. We're gonna uh, send, sign off to everybody out there in TV land, and then uh, you'll be back again. So, Doctor Elaine, wonderful. See you next time. Bye. Yep. Great. Yep.